The energy and persistence with which the documentary has examined the globe in a television lifespan of only 30 years has been remarkable. In 1952, the BBC began the first real documentary series in this country. It opened with a film on housing in Glasgow. So you've come to Glasgow, have you? Pretty grim, isn't it? Dirt, filth, stench everywhere. And believe me, there are literally hundreds of back courts, every bit as bad as this in Glasgow. And it was so grim that after the programme finished, we had lots of phone calls. They did not believe that the slums of the Gorbals could exist. They thought in some way we had faked the thing. Television could therefore show people something which they might have read about, they might have seen still photographs. Now, of course, they believe everything. But only 10 years later, an American audience were taking in stride film of a dangerous rescue tunnel being dug into East Berlin under the wall. The sound of the tunnel itself. A streetcar running along Bernauer Strasse, 15 feet straight up. If they could hear sounds made 15 feet above, could the Vopos hear sounds 15 feet below? The Vopos they knew had listening devices. Each foot closer to their goal brought them one foot nearer to the danger of capture. They could not know who... Ten years later, in 1972, equipment had been perfected to show remarkable close-ups of bird flight in motion. Three years ago, in 1982, almost the ultimate, a Swedish documentary from inside the human body itself. The camera is now making a remarkable journey. It's traveling the same route as a sperm. It's on its way out of the male sex organ, and it's now passing through the vas deferens. And here, the sperm armada continues on its long journey and now finds itself in the urethra. We started, after the war, with the audience a blank sheet of paper. Almost everything one could film, they had not seen before. Now people have seen almost everything. There is nothing new under the sun, and the subject matter is all being used up. So from that point of view, it's more difficult to do something which is new. documentary always had an audience from the earliest days of BBC television. The Crown Film Unit had built a wartime cinema audience recording the lives of ordinary people but they had trouble recording the most important element, location sound, with the heavy 35 millimeter studio cameras. There's no question that sound, in many ways, is the most important ingredient because sound carries all the intelligence, it carries the humor, it carries the personalities. Calling all workers. That same piece of film came to life when a radio track was added back at base. TV documentary came of age almost immediately with a stunning portrait of ordinary people in the streets of a northern city. In a rare piece of poetry, Dennis Mitchell solved the sound problem by running BBC radio tapes over pictures. Impossible to imagine that never before in the history of the world had people ever heard real people talking. All they'd heard on the BBC radio were actors announcers and all that sort of thing, or else real people, what I call, used to call real people, reading scripts. 
He picks it up, the vet, looks at it. He said, this budgie's not egg bound. He said, it's got a tumour. And with that, he just threw it in the fire. So Madge says, good heavens, she says, my lads will go mad. What did you do that for? He said, well, cremation is the most hygienic thing, madam. That will be seven and six. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, get the flaming thing here, Barry. Get something new to this at town with that thing when he's chewing and going on with this stuff. He's been being a good boy. As I was telling you, over this here new job I've been after, you see. Um, the landlord came up, you see, the other day, and he said to me, is your sister still living with you? And I said, yes, it's such a can't put that in the So I started to speak to her, and I said, um, I suppose you're wondering why I'm uh, reading my Bible in here. She said, well, it, it did seem a bit... Uh, talk, said, talk, talk. I love to listen to it. Go round in the mornings, down the street, yap, 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 yap. Chow, the chow, landlord chow. came up, you said, love the other to day, listen and he to said to me... I'd fallen in love with the human voice, really. The way people talked. It wasn't what they said so much as how they said it. And these you can't reproduce. Actors can't do it. We've tried. Uh, you can't reproduce it the passion and the sadness in prison. I spent three weeks in prison, actually in a cell. And now the prison lies quiet. Most of the men will be asleep now. But in some cells, there will be men lying on their beds, staring, staring at a blank wall, or crying. Men cry easily and often here, or talking endlessly to themselves. Their thoughts going round and round, like squiddles in a cage. Supposing I escape. There are only about four people in the whole world with whom I'd like to spend the rest of my life. If I escape, they're the only people I shan't be able to go near. I think myself that five years that I got for three years, I got it for taking three eightpence off a counter in Bolton. Your brain's always working, working till it it sends you a bit mental some road, must do. Come on, get out of it. At last morning. Poetry. Wherever I go, meeting people, I'm absolutely astonished the whole time. Now! just as much as them, at people's quality of strength and dignity and all this stuff, it's still here. <laughs> Thou shalt not squander away thy daily pay by the means of pontoon. <laughs> Banker. Oh, brag. <laughs> These early documentaries were poetic statements. They revealed human character in a world before it had been changed by mass culture. if I pass the exam. And then we think I'm going to um, Cambridge and Trinity Hall. I had this terrible curiosity about other people. And I think I caught it from my mother. You know, I remember once she came home and she said, uh, I heard a woman today say to another woman, and we never ate margarine since my dad died. There's a whole novel there, and she was so excited about it. Marvelous. And I caught this sort of curiosity. And I thought that I'd very much like to do a portrait of a community. I chose a mining village in Yorkshire 
and chose a wedding as a theme. And people were therefore feeling personally emotional. And I thought they're more likely to tell the truth. <laughs> wedding on Saturday people were extremely optimistic. Uh, what they talked about the present and the future, meaning 1963 onwards, was in fact full of optimism without any doubt whatever. How old are you? Fifteen. Your address? Uh, 97 Canford Crescent, Grimsby. Let's see what chips we have available. Yes, there's a vacancy on the Ross Renown. Uh, uh, we'll put you on that one. Uh, does that go to Ireland? Yes. Uh, It'll be away for three weeks. Uh, oh, could you tell me where it sails, please? The day after tomorrow. Mm, so soon. qualities are still there. Television companies have changed. I think it all, the rot started for me, for me when the journalist took possession of television. You, know, you see presidents assassinated and riots, blood all over the place. Much more exciting than um, a scrap of poetry. We're on a C-47. We're going over enemy territory. The TV documentary took on a new form. Journalists with microphones and opinions were telling their audience what to think. In front of me is a pile of leaflets which say, bring this leaflet in and you will be getting safe passage. Signed, General Mark Clark. All that mattered now was the script. Here in Korea, the American journalist Ed Morrow was inventing the formula later used by hundreds of panoramas and world in actions. Now over to Ed Morrow. They tell me that this gun is called Baby. Who named it anyway? Pictures are important, but the picture was secondary to what Morrow was saying. But if you don't get the word right, typewriter, pencil, writing it down, getting it straight, and then let the picture follow it, you're in trouble. Have you got your Christmas presents all right? Yes, sir. I'm waiting on about five more. About five more. Heard from your girl? Yes, sir. Good. The sheer bulk of the 35 millimeter camera meant that you couldn't move about, move it about very easily. And so we had to rehearse people. You live here? Live here? You don't call this living. I call this existing. Who could live under these circumstances? But however, we'll never lack company. We've always got the rats. So one was actually rehearsing members of the public as if they were actors. Mr. Malcolm, I'm Jemison Clark from the BBC. The documentary journalists were different. They were advocates. Their idea in the 50s and 60s was to use television to solve social problems. They uncovered unpleasant truths. How often do you have uh, visitors? Well, very seldom, I'm like this. What will you be doing on Christmas Day? On Christmas Day? Well, I'll just say I'll be in bed. 
I felt that I was in a very privileged position to be uh, allowed to make 45 minutes programs about whatever social problem it might be and to persuade people to accept the point of view which I wanted to put across in the programs. What are the main difficulties of teaching in this room? Well, the main difficulty, I think, is the, the question of people passing through to get from one room to another. There's... When you come to the end of the program, you should feel you've experienced something. Whereas, when you've watched a current affairs program, you've probably been told about it. You've gathered a certain amount of information. You haven't actually experienced it. This scene is not taking place in the Congo. It has nothing to do with Johannesburg or Cape Town. These are citizens of the United States, 1960. These are the forgotten people, the underprotected, the undereducated, the underclothed, the underfed. The world was a simple place then. People were optimistic. It was thought the problems of poverty, homelessness and race would be solved by putting them on television. But this was journalism, not art. It would be forgotten. But the artists fought back, helped by new technology. The way the world was making documentary films was haywire, that we had to stop lecturing. That is, we had to stop the narration and let people talk. We needed a way to capture that. And we spent a half a million dollars, I would say, on making uh, the Oricon camera work smaller, lighter, become portable. This was the result, the lightweight camera that could go anywhere recording sounds and emotions. Robert Drew had discovered a new documentary form, reality as it happened. So I went to Washington and proposed to Kennedy that we were going to start a new kind of filmmaking. The camera would have to live with him from dawn to dusk for a week or so. No reporter asking him questions. We weren't interested in him talking to us. We were interested in seeing what he did. Brought him to and talked about education. To do it for 15 minutes, I think, would alleviate a lot of problems. Well, if we could do it, I suppose, if we could do it, I don't know if you want to do it a half hour. The president has called Robert Kennedy to confer on Alabama and civil rights. The president must decide whether or not to speak out anyway in a nationwide TV address. Well, anyway, well, we'll, let's pass on now. To, I think that we're, uh, we're going to... I guess we're going to get something ready anyway because it may be with tomorrow. Well, we got a draft. A man at his desk, whether it's the Oval Office or any other desk, is a man in a closet. And uh, a film resulting from that will be a dull film no matter who's behind that desk. But if we can wait until there's a crisis, until your back is to the wall and you have to make decisions that are difficult, then we'll have a film. Robert Kennedy had a crisis. As Attorney General, he was trying to get Hello? black students enrolled at Alabama University in the Deep South. Hello? Drew now had a dramatic storyline. George Wallace, the governor, has said he will physically stand in the doorway and prevent the students coming in. This is Robert Kennedy's representative on the campus, Nicholas Katzenbach. From the governor. Yeah, but is he talking directly to the governor, Katzenbach? And I've come here to ask you now for an unequivocal assurance that you will permit these students, who after all merely want an education at the great university... Well, now, you make your statement, but we don't need you to make a speech. You make your statement. I will make my statement, Governor. I was in the process of making my statement. And I'm asking from you an unequivocal assurance that you will not bar entry to these students, to Vivian Malone and to James Hood, and that you will step aside peacefully and do your constitutional duty as Governor. Drama is lived out in people's minds. And how close can you get to the feelings of people, to seeing into people instead of looking at them? Uh, is he getting to talk to the governor? Emotion and drama are the things that are missing from the documentary film today, which could be the basis for a television journalism that would involve everybody, involve large audiences, in learning about what's going on in the world. In the 60s, filmmakers with the new mobile cameras would find remarkable drama. Documentary reached a high point. This is the resolution as the tunnelers break through into East Berlin. Two Fopos walked past one casually glancing in the shrapnel pitted doorway of number seven. In 10 minutes, the first of the refugees would come. 
They would come through in this order. First, Peter's wife and baby and mother. And then Peter would come through. And behind him, Hasso Herschel's sister and her family. This was heroism, this was an adventure of the human spirit that showed that people would still risk for matters of principle and freedom and so forth. The opportunity for a film crew to be present as an event unfolds instead of arriving after it has burst out and asking a lot of people what had happened is, is rare in any context. At the end of the 60s, the documentary camera went further afield and found exotic new faces. But the filmmakers found these lives and habits were remarkably similar to the ones they had already been recording in the West. For many viewers, the documentary is no more complicated than the vast world of nature. Almost as strange as the pictures themselves is the length to which the small group of cameramen experts are prepared to go to get their subject. So when this whole gadget and myself were in the water filming, it looked to an ordinary pelican like an oversized pelican. So finally, I had the whole thing assembled and I went into the water and I was really very nervous whether it would work or whether it wouldn't. So I slowly, I had to swim about one and a half miles around the island to face the pelicans which were all in the water. No matter how much equipment you have or how much you know about the animals, many things can still go wrong. And something usually does. Hunter and hunted may disappear into a sea of long grass. or into a cloud of dust. Or the cheetah, after a good start, may lose the gazelle. The black-necked or spitting cobra not only has a deadly bite, but can also spit its venom for up to six feet. It aims for the eyes, the spitting action lasts only a twentieth of a second. Joan has only one problem. She is the target. When Alan is ready, she will move in to make the snake spit right on cue. But the social documentary would change, largely because of television itself. Tonight, an Eastern Airlines passenger jet is forced down at Miami International. A close call for the passengers. He had two big trees there. He could have got a, easily gotten a blade strike. And we 
streets out here in the middle of nowhere. At the end of the 60s, nightly news images flooded endlessly into our homes. We saw everything. The world grew up. Man even walked on the moon. To compete, the television documentary, too, would lose its innocence. The television documentary uh, makers now re are reflecting what they see on the television news. And the tendency is to make programs about institutions. We produced a documentary about the highest crime police precinct in the uh, city, which is in, located in the South Bronx. And it was a portrait of the officers and their daily confrontation with uh, crime situations. This is where they have a, a crap game over here. They got the other uh, crap, crap game, game right here. Over here. Over here. Over here. Over here. Say, a crap game here. Yeah, now you watch everybody there. run, except the guy dancing. <laughs> I don't want to see any, any of the, uh, the dice rolling. Chaotic. They're obviously not going to move until we can uh, get more assistance to do something about it, have after police in the USA came police in Britain. The documentary was now a series, using up the lives of policemen, hospital patients and servicemen, as if they were in a soap opera. In the series Sailor, a new pilot is trying to land on HMS Ark Royal. Another stress situation. When he's coming there for the first time, he's obviously very nervous. Understandably so. He's heard all of the hairy stories of people crashing on the deck and so forth. He goes high in close, it's only say. And he's a new guy, so he's worth watching. He's very slow, monsieur. Bolt up, bolt up, bolt up. Yeah, it's just get the LSS and just have a chat to him. Yeah. It's a little slow. This is his first time ever to the deck. Hiya. Check that. Nice keep it coming. Hiya. Keep it coming down. Yeah. Now that's better. Let's come on. Keep it coming down. Keep it coming down. There you're rotating you. Bolt up, bolt up. I'm telling you, I said to tell you that was a much better approach. And the next time, just keep on the board and keep it coming down. Don't worry about getting down to the deck. If you're on speed, on the beat, you'll be in the water. He said it. <laughs> nice, nice. Keep it coming down. Keep it coming down. Come down, come down. No, no. Just lift his own. I think he's had enough for one day. Keith, if he votes this time, I'm going to send him to the woman. Okay, six, seven approaches now. Good yes. rollers. Yes. That's enough. Yes, yes it is. Yes. 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 That, now, this is better than the just last two. Just a little bit longer, just a little bit further out. Don't go high. Hold it there, man. I'm coming down. Come on, get it down. Get it down. Come on. He's on. Yeah. Hey, hey, good. Good. <laughs> 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 I don't know what's happening now. <laughs> I'm glad I'm on. Put it that way. Journalists who ran the news documentary programs were also reflecting the alarming decades of the 70s and 80s. But the problems they were now recording were well beyond the scope of television to solve. The problems are more difficult to solve in the 80s than the 60s, undoubtedly. And I suppose that um, many television filmmakers, uh, documentaries, might feel almost guilty if they did something as naive as a portrait of a Yorkshire village built round a, a wedding and all the people who took part had no particular problems at all. Viewers expect television to solve the problems. The television can't do that. Television is there to expose the problems. It's up to the authorities and to governments, and in the final analysis, to the electorate, to do something to change them. World in Action helped an impressive number of causes onto the national agenda. But surprisingly, there was seldom direct change. The images had perhaps become too familiar. What I'm saying is that there is nobody who works for us in Salon who at the end of a week 
or at the end of a day, has not got enough money with which to buy himself enough to eat. What is she suffering from? Malnutrition, anemia. And bronchitis. Bronchitis at the moment. This program helped to end starvation on British-owned tea plantations in Sri Lanka. How would you prove that you are the parents of your children? What would you do to prove that I haven't done? You tell me I will do that to prove that I'm the mother of those three children. The program would prove she really did have three children halfway around the world, and it would put pressure on the Home Office to reunite the family in this country. And, notably, one man's journalism raised 19 million pounds for food and medicines in Cambodia. But direct results like these were surprisingly few. There are 558 people in this, the main hospital of Phnom Penh, and most of them are children and babies. They are dying because they have virtually nothing of value to eat. No fresh water, no vitamins, no milk. And there are no medicines to speak of, no antibiotics, and not even enough bandages. One little boy's screams can be heard out in the street, rising and falling in agony. He is starving. ...being made, like World in Action and so on. Um, which, when you saw a good documentary, it really pulled you up short because you knew that was actually happening. And we wanted uh, drama to have that same kick. And the other thing is, that in a month's time, we've got a place to go to. You've got a place in a month's time? Yes, on the new Smithson estate. They're giving us a new flat there. We're told that you lost your place on the list long ago, owing to moving. 500 families have moved in already. But we was meant to be one of those families. After this documentary about Quentin Crisp by Dennis Mitchell, art would mirror life again in a television play, which had more impact. I could offer you a huge great glass of stout. Thank you. I drink this stuff at dawn, because it makes the day shorter. My appearance is mild now, compared with what it was like 40 years ago, when my hair was hennaed. My eyelids were gold. My fingernails and my toenails were gold. And I was blind with mascara and dumb with lipstick. Sometimes it led to my being beaten up. Mauled about and sometimes actually beaten up. But this, of course, I had to expect. He said, I'm ready now to die. I have nothing more to say. I'm a perfect work of art. And and finished. Not very long after that film. Instead of dying, he went to America and became an enormous success. It was Jack Gold's film which followed mine two or three years later, which really made his fame and fortune. Evening, gentlemen. What's you got makeup on for? Who's it? He's a woman. He's a geezer. I may speak for a moment. Allow me to reassure you that. That's it. Those TV movies that are shown as docudramas of real story, real life people stories tend to attract much larger audiences than documentaries. They use well-known stars. The production values are obviously much higher. They can dramatize things that a documentary filmmaker might find extremely difficult to actually happen upon with his or her camera. In America, the television documentary is being killed by news and drama series. Alan and Susan Raymond made this famous documentary, The Police Tapes. It later became the model for a soap opera. All right, I got something here. It's guys that are in the Supposed to be in this command. He's wanted in the, by the 2 8 for attempted murder with a gun. Uh, he's living right now at 1240 Walton Avenue. Make, make a couple stops up there just in case during the night and see if you can come up with him. All right, 1185 Anderson, right? The Black Liberation Army. They seem to be milling around that area again. They're talking about a Volkswagen Red. John, what's the car you saw last night? The Volkswagen Red. That's it. That's the end of the story. Let's be careful out in the street. Let's go. Come on. Take a pause. It really was the model for the TV series Hill Street Blues. One must say that they viewed our documentary 
and chose not only the concept of the police precinct in a kind of dangerous neighborhood, but also really many of the stylistic devices as well, the handheld camera work. Starsky and Hutch will not be seen tonight so that we may bring you the following special program from ABC News. To compete, the documentary in America has had to become more sensational than drama. It's got to work. Brings me money, brings me a lot of things. I don't use it just to shoot people and all that, you know. Just use it for protection, you dig? This is what talks around this neighborhood. You see, a documentary in that market has difficulty in competing. And too often it has to outdo in sensationalism, in bizarre in a provocative nature of the investigation, sometimes very irresponsibly, I must say. To counter falling ratings, the Japanese have invented a new documentary form, simulated action. Here, a team of 800 Sherpa porters are beginning the ascent of Everest for a Japanese television company. Rather bizarrely, their object is to help this man to ski down Everest. Chomo Luma, mother goddess of the world. Six weeks later, and after the deaths of six Sherpas, our hero is ready to ski 8,000 feet down the mountainside. If it's behind me, the chute may not open. The parachute, slow to open. Try to break. Diagonal sidestep. Use the edges. Nothing worked. There was no fear. No fear, it's just nothing. My ski cobbles. I put the ice on my back. The big rock. The back shoot. I wonder what it meant, being alive. Films where sensationalism becomes the only subject matter can only be a temporary answer to the documentary's falling audience. So what is the future? The Japanese have done a lot more with time than we have. We've fully exploited place. Uh, the, the other important ingredient, time, the Japanese have been very patient and shown us that they can make a film over 15 or even 20 years. This is the story of Takashi, a thalidomide victim filmed over a period of 15 years in Japan. Since we're surrounded by people who are being born and dying and, and falling in love and getting married and going bankrupt and making millions and, uh, and climbing Mount Everest and so forth, uh, we're surrounded by real life drama. But uh, our problem is that we've insisted on conveying this by talking about it instead of living it with, uh, uh, through the camera. So anyhow, uh... Human character seems to disappear when the documentary has to compete with news and drama. But when one American family was filmed over a period of seven months in 1973, this simple idea produced drama of warmth and texture. Oh, 
She says that she wants you to come up and take us all out to dinner some, well, not her, but um, everybody else, out to dinner some night. Why? Uh, su Sunday night, because she says it, it'll be nice for them. Because we, Dad, you're like a pop star. We only hear about you and see your picture in fan <laughs> magazines. We never see you in person anymore. Never see the real Bill. The Lott. real well, you, you have man. To come down and, and I'm available from eight to five in the office every day. Uh, yeah. For consultation, loans, well, touches, those, uh, advice, <laughs> whatever you want. Well, I've those got those. Down there, baby. <laughs> Well, Dad, we're beginning to think that you took the business of being a father too lightly. <laughs> Why, we're even thinking that you've forgotten about it altogether. <laughs> the same idea was repeated in Britain in 1974 with the Wilkins family of Reading. In this country, where the single documentary is now under pressure from ratings, this too could be a solution. Well, they're only my parents. I mean, they've only got my interest at heart, that's yeah, all. Look, look, I'm marrying you, right? But when we've got a date... You thanks. marry me, mate. You marry my family. I oh, know that, but we'll wait for a minute. Look, when we've got a date fixed up and that, fair enough. Right? You can tell them. And they go, well, until then, right? As I say, leave it till tonight till we come in, right? And then we can talk about it. Because we know, we've said before, and you agree with me that we will not get married on the 27th. We I'm leave. not agreeing with you putting off at all. No, well, if I, you're I, involved I, in I, something I, really vital and compelling in real life, it'll have virtues of the short story and uh, virtues of the modern novel and virtues of the, of the movie, uh, and uh, it'll be real. For the moment, we are descending the ladder and going in for um, news, Facts and not fancies. I don't know really. And that God knows what's going to happen in the future. Next online, our Sunday movie premiere, Second Sight, a love story followed by highlights of the cup.